This video is brought to you by Mubi, a curated streaming service showcasing exceptional films from around the globe. Start your one month free trial right now by going to mubi.com slash entertain the elk. Players, young, a new assistant lighthouse keeper with a sordid past, old, a crusty lighthouse keeper, his boss. Setting, somewhere far off the coast of Maine, around 1890. Note. This film must be photographed on black and white 35mm negative. Aspect ratio 119 to 1. Audio mix mono. This is an author's note by Robert and Max Eggers for their screenplay, The Lighthouse. It comes before the actual script begins and highlights the elements of The Lighthouse that immediately stand out to the audience. The actors, the setting, and the precise technical aspects that help drop the audience into this world at the turn of the 20th century. Notice how the word must is italicized to add emphasis. These stylistic choices aren't optional, they're integral to the overall mood of the story and ultimately the film's success. Besides these visual elements, I found myself utterly captivated by another stylistic choice that isn't as readily apparent, the language. And that's because the first word of dialogue isn't spoken until nearly seven minutes into the film. Should pale death with treble dread make the ocean caves our bed? God, who is the surge's role, deign to save our suppliant soul. This bit of dialogue is actually pulled from a poem by Lydia Sigourney titled Sailor's Hymn at Parting. The fact that the first bit of dialogue spoken in the film is an actual poem presented as a toast speaks to two things. The elevated language prevalent throughout the film and the related works that Robert and Max Eggers drew from for inspiration. The entire premise of The Lighthouse is loosely based on the Smalls Lighthouse tragedy of 1801, where one of the two-member team died in a freak accident and the other slowly descended into madness. But in order for the dialogue to seem period accurate, Eggers drew from the works of writer Sarah Orne Jewett, a writer at the turn of the century who focused on life in Maine, and also drew from poetry, sea shanties, historical texts, and even lighthouse keepers journals from that era. A stickler for period accuracy and authenticity, Robert and his brother Max held tightly to these works in order to help hone the dialect. They even peppered the script with actual lines and songs from these texts. If but the sun were a hearty river my brother and I used many, many sources, but the cornerstone became the work of Sarah Orne Jewett, who was a Maine-based author writing in the period that this film takes place. She would interview farmers and sailors and sea captains, and she would write dialect phonetically. So Rob's accent is based on an old-timey New England Down East accent, or at least our interpretation of that. Willem's dialect is the way that maritime people spoke. The dialects are my best interpretation of something that is accurate. Obviously, you can never know, but you're trying to create something that is based on research and feel consistent. The result is this beautiful mix of Shakespeare with sea captains, almost like pirate poetry. You're an open book. A picture, says I. A painted actress screaming in the footlights. A bitch what wants to be coveted for nothing but being born, crying about the silver spoon what should have been yours. Oh, what protein. Or swim up from men's minds and melt in hot Promethean plunder, scorching eyes with divine shames and horror, and casting them down to Davy Jones. In a number of interviews and speeches for the lighthouse, Willem Dafoe repeatedly referred to the dialogue as elevated language. It's elevated, man. You have this beautiful elevated language. What Defoe is referring to here is a style of speech that is more formal and complex in comparison to the ordinary speech we use every day. Elevated sounds poetic because it contains figurative language, such as metaphor, simile, and allusion, in order to communicate thoughts and ideas. It's often used to offer dignity and reverence to important events and rituals, and to heroes, kings, and gods. Eggers uses language here as another subtle reminder of the growing conflict between our two main characters. As the young farmer speaks in prose, while the old sailor speaks in poetry. Defoe's character drifts in and out of elevated speech during toasts, dances, curses, blessings, and even his own burial. But I want to examine what is perhaps the best moment in the entire film, the lobster scene. You're fond of me lobster, ain't you? Say it. Say it! I don't have to say nothing. Danny! 
In the script, it says, Old speaks more powerfully and passionately than any Tamberlin or Lear. Tamberlin refers to the titular emperor in the play Tamberlin the Great by Christopher Marlowe, and Lear refers to the titular king in the play King Lear by William Shakespeare, a contemporary of Christopher Marlowe. Let Neptune strike ye dead, Winslow! He speaks a curse upon Winslow, invoking Neptune, god of the sea in Roman mythology. Hark! Hark! Triton! Hark! He also calls upon Triton, god of the sea in Greek mythology. Hello! Bid our father, the sea king, rise from the depths full, foul in his fury, black waves teeming with salt foam. First, the old man builds reverence for the Sea King through descriptions of his power and wrath. Bellow is a deep roar, poetic alliteration in full foul in his fury, followed by descriptions of the sea that he will use as a weapon, black waves and salt foam. To smother this young mouth with punch and slime, to choke ye, engorging your organs till ye turn blue and bloated with builds and brine and can scream no more. Then he uses nautical terms, and again alliteration, to poetically describe the effects that will happen to the young man's body once he's killed by the Sea King. Blue, bloated, bilge, and brine. Bilge being an outer surface of a ship's hull, and brine being salt water. He also uses a synecdoche when referring to the man as a young mouth. A synecdoche is a figure of speech where a part represents the whole. In this case, the mouth represents the person. Using the term mouth also highlights the way he sees the young man, as someone who constantly argues and criticizes. Crowned in cockle shells, with slithering tentacle tail, and steaming beard take up his fell befinned arm. His coral tine trident screeches banshee-like in the tempest. He builds up the Sea King with terrifying imagery, a crown of cockle shells, slithering tentacle tail, steaming beard, befinned arm. He uses a simile to compare the screech of his trident to that of a banshee, and how the god's presence brings a violent storm. Bursting ye, a bulging bladder no more, but a blasted bloody film now a nothing for the harpies and the souls of dead sailors to pick and claw and feed upon. Again, he describes the torment that will soon befall the young man. There's more alliteration, bursting, bulging bladder, blasted bloody. And after the Sea King is done, there will be nothing for even the birds to feed upon. Not harpies, which are half-human, half-birds from both Roman and Greek mythology, and not seagulls, which earlier in the film he claims contain the souls of dead sailors. Forgotten to any man, to any time, forgotten to any god or devil, forgotten even to the sea. Repetition is utilized to enforce the insignificance of the young man. For any stuff or part of Winslow, even any scantling of your soul, is Winslow no more, but is now itself the sea. And in the end, the young man will be reduced to nothing and will become part of what destroyed him, the sea. This epic monologue is written as one long detailed sentence. And only after having seen the film, it's clear that this monologue prophesies every nightmare that follows. The cockle shells, the tentacle tail, the storm, and Winslow's eventual death as he's fed upon by seagulls. Using such elevated language to curse a man's body and soul for simply saying he doesn't like their cooking only adds to the insanity, dark humor, and poetry that's prevalent throughout the lighthouse. This kind of elevated language is usually reserved for plays, poetry, and novels, but films like The Lighthouse prove that screenplays, as a genre of literature, can be every bit as complex, poetic, and meaningful. All right, have it your way. I like to cook it. I love watching independent films with auteur directors and unique offbeat storylines, but it's not always easy to find these kind of films. But that's exactly why I love MUBI. MUBI is an online cinema that streams hand-selected films from around the globe. Every day, MUBI premieres a new film. Whether it's a timeless classic, a cult favorite, or an award-winning documentary, there's always something new to discover. With MUBI, every film is hand-selected, so you'll actually spend time watching films as opposed to just scanning through thousands and thousands of titles. It's like your own personal film festival, streaming anytime, anywhere. 
Start your one month free trial right now by going to movie.com slash entertaining elk. Thanks everyone for watching. I hope you enjoyed this video. I watched The Lighthouse only a few weeks ago and it completely blew me away. So much so that I needed to make this video essay just so I could talk about how much I loved it. Do yourself a favor and go check it out, but not before subscribing and clicking the bell below. That way you'll be notified every time Entertain the Elk drops a new video. Thanks again everyone for watching and I'll see you all next time.